All right, well, welcome to another afternoon of Under the Hood. And I have to say, as we wrap up the basement uh, this month, focusing on the low voices of the world, <laughs> uh, I, I cannot even imagine a better way to top this off than with uh, my esteemed colleague, friend, low voice partner in crime, Morris Robinson. So thanks so much, man, for being here. What's and, up, man? <laughs> how, how's, here? Everything, how's everything been going for you? Hey, you know what? It's uh, it's listen. It's uh, okay. Like everybody else, everything's been shut down, right? But yeah, yeah. you know, I've also been very blessed because every opera company is hiring somebody to sing in the bass class. They've been calling me, man. So I've been really, I'm busier now than ever. I started looking at gigs and thinking I'm bottleneck at the top. I got so much stuff to learn. But you know, try to knock it down as much as you can. Uh, I'm getting my voice back in shape because you know sitting around four years not good for the voice. But yeah, man, it's been it's been an interesting year just trying to put things together and and uh, respond when called upon and and maintain some semblance of normalcy. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think at the end of the day, that's all we can do. And how yeah. how amazing is it that uh, you get to a certain point in your career where you're the go to guy? You know, it's like well, as we as we come up, you know, it's like we have these these idols and these, these, we, we, you know, it's like we, we put them on a, a pedestal of perhaps even unwarranted sake. Right. But at some point, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we scoot them off and we take their places and, and for you to, for you to kind of be that, that guy, I mean, I've seen, I've, you know, I've seen all the different things you, you, you just mentioned before we went live that you're about to do <laughs> uh, a recital down at Dallas opera. Yeah, man, I got a recital coming up next week. It's been really weird watching because I would, I would get up in the morning and the first thing I do, is go out on my back porch, close the door, and start warming up outdoors in all the pollen. Why? Because that's the most difficult. <laughs> Wait, now you're you're in Atlanta, right? Yeah, I'm in Atlanta. Everything here is yellow, man. It's like it, completely yellow. Yeah. Same in Houston. Same in Houston. It's like, right. yeah, absolutely. So I'm out. You know, I'm trying to get the voice used to those environment that that type of stuff because you know I got to sing next week, so I'm gonna be ready for anything. So yes, yeah, I got to recital next week. I got a, uh, you know, I got the thing in Detroit that we did going to Chicago, get to them wrong. Get done with that. I got like, I go to Hamburg to do a Porgy. I come back, I'm singing a, a Verdi Requiem in Dallas before I, I go do a, I'm doing a thing at Wolf Trap. And then, uh, yeah, I'm just busy, man. Very, very blessed. Yeah. That's amazing. And recently you were just in, in Germany doing like a film version of Flute, right? I was, yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that. It won't be out until the fall of 22, but uh, my dog just ran in. It's not okay. <laughs> the whole thing, but the, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like all right. There's a kid who happens to be Tomino, you know, who's at a boarding school in Austria, and he discovers a hidden portal that's centuries old that takes him into the world of Mozart's magic flute. So you have this juxtaposition going on. It's kind of like you know Avatar. You have the real world, and then you have the Avatar world. Well, you have the real world and the magic flute world, and I'm Zoroastro. So I only get to sing one half of one aria in English. Okay. So it's not really a musical. It's really a movie. Like I'm really trying to act. So it should be interesting. <laughs> you're like you're like I I had to uh, dust off the old Stanislavski book and go exactly. Back to, it's like go back to the basics. Like I I see you want me to act too. Wait, like, okay, hold on. Yeah, <laughs> that should be a, what's the hierarchy? Well, you sing then act. No, this is acting first. So it should be cool, man. That's interesting. I mean, talk a little bit about that. I mean, you you know, you and I kind of you mentioned this before in our conversation. We, we sort of came up together and, and we did a lot of those competitions. And so yeah. you know, there has been a significant transition between like what the opera world looked like. Oh, I don't know, circa 1980, even 1990, you know, as to as to what it was when we were really young artists and then mm -hmm. making that transition from young artists into into, you know, working artists, um, specifically with that whole acting, you know, aspect, you know, the park and bark let's say, you know, time had ended pr probably a solid decade before it ended, 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 yeah. ended right? Yeah. Um, but uh, in your experience, um, what kind of uh, challenges have you sort of been, been met with uh, when it comes to that? Because I know, you know, a lot of people, and, and depending on what role you're singing, of course, you know, some of the, some of the requests by different directors are like, <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you ever tried to sing this while you're running up yeah. three flights of stairs? Exactly, or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that the, with the advent of technology, obviously things are going to change. Yeah. Um, but the acoustics in live theaters don't change. 
Right. But what is being asked of us because of high definition television and camera angles and that type of thing has changed. So yeah. uh, to compare the two since we're talking about the movie, I had to really refocus on small frame because, you know, my first scene, just like in the op opera, I walk out, there's hundreds of people yelling and screaming my name. And I want to address everyone like this. But you don't really have to do that on camera, you know. Right, so right I, on camera. That. But, you know, if you get caught up in that in the opera world because, you know, you see all these cameras around, you'll throw yourself off. You have to always sing to the house. And that's the only thing I think that's kept me uh, aware. And the facial expressions and all that I do were always organic. But now you're just conscientious that they're catching everything all of a sudden. So it's, yeah. it's different, but still the same. At the end of the day, we got to sing to the house. You know, right. I'm much rather like this recital next week has me freaked out because they're streaming it. I don't want to sing to the camera. I want to sing to the house. You know, it's just like, get it out of my face. So, it, it, so, so it's no audience, but it's so there in the wind spirit. It's no audience, but just uh, streaming? A very select audience. I think it's like 200 people. Oh, okay. So, okay. okay. You know. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, in that situation, yeah. I mean, sing to the house and, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it does feel a little bit like you're breaking the fourth wall and trying to be yeah. like, Oh, hello. I'm singing. Right, to right, you. Right. <laughs> it feels probably makes the other person on the other side be like, oh, he's singing just to, <laughs> just to me. <laughs> yeah. It's well, interesting. You know, it certainly changes our mindset, you know, the and our focus. So yeah. what was what was the first uh filmed opera that you did where you had to have that sort of uh subconscious of going, okay, wait a minute, where what what's what's the camera angle? What's going on with this? Well, that's interesting because uh, I actually did the Zalame in 04, but we didn't make the DVD, DVD until 08. But I was asked to do the very first Met broadcast, HD broadcast. That was the Magic Flute. And okay. uh, I was the one until some German bass named Renee Papa popped up and they said, we want you to sing it first. Who? Exactly. Yeah, some guy. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, you do know this is in English, right? But, you know, they wanted the name and that kind of thing. Uh, Interestingly enough, and I'm going to say this on your show and people will laugh or whatever. I don't care. It's the truth. He's the reason we only seen one verse of Indies and Hulk in Holland in the English version. Because in the second verse, he went, Indies and Hulk and Bog. Oops. He started the scene He would German. start doing it in German and right. then be like, so, oh, wait, whoops, sorry. So they had to cut it and then take the ending together. And so, all right, now, so we sing one verse in English. So there you go. That's amazing. That is an amazing. Yeah, instead of within a holy time. No, he singing Disney Halligan Holland, and there you go. So, That's amazing. That's thanks, amazing. Renee. I get a full check for singing half the aria. Thank you. Hey, listen, <laughs> there, there's been, there, you've probably done more for less, so that's good. Right. Well, how did you, how did you get, you know, the premise of the show, of course, is to kind of find out, lift the veil, as it were, um, mm -hmm. and, and find out how you got started and sort of, what were those, um, I don't know, awareness moments that, you know, through vocal technique that we kind of make our way through. So how did, how did you, how did you get started in music and singing to begin with? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's pretty traditional, you know, most, uh, most African-American singers start off in the church. You know, I was in church. I hated it. So I ended up being the church drummer. That was a lot cooler than being in a choir. So it's like uh, a contemporary, a contemporary service got with a. No, with it's a, just just black southern service down south. You know, it's I tell people all the time when you listen to black gospel music, you hear everything from funk, soul, calypso, waltz. You know, bossa nova is. You know, we have all types of different styles, and you just kind of you kind of fit that groove and you figure it out. So I, I was amazing. exposed to a lot of different styles just doing that. Yeah. But uh, I was a drummer. I became a church drummer. My mother made me audition for the Atlanta Boy Choir. Well, wait, at what age what, did you become the drummer? nine <laughs> you you play and did you have a like did you did you practice drumming before that or they were like Morris yeah. get up here put the here this is a drumstick here's a drum <laughs> see this is the thing the black church experience is really weird if you sit think about it. no one says you're going to be the next pianist we're going to groom you no one says you're going to be the next drummer you already know who they are and how do you tell it's the guy sitting next to the drummer watching everything he does Give him about three or four years and give him a pair of sticks and watch what happens. Well, I was the guy that sat next to the drummer and watched him all the time. And so when he left, my dad, I was like, dad, I want to play drums. He bought me a drum set. And the first day he bought me a set, I went and put on like the Walter Hawkins album and started playing everything. He was like, how did you know how to do that? And I'm like, I don't know. 
And so you know, just, I don't know. I just I just I watched the great the great person that was been playing for the last ten years or whatever. Right. It just turns out that way. And, and interestingly enough, two of the young kids that used to watch me play, one of them is a professional drummer to this day. The other one still plays for his church, and they're all like they're like wow. my little brothers. So it's just the tradition of the church, man. You just you you pick it up as you go. Uh, the pianist is the same way. You'll see some seventeen year old kid walk into a church with a backpack on with a t-shirt and his baseball cap on backwards and sit down at the organ and make the church go crazy. It's like, how do you, without taking a lesson ever, you know? So it's just wow, one of those magical things that happens in the black church. So, yeah. That's incredible. So, so you started playing the drums and then yeah. where, did, where did that end up going? I ended up going to a uh, Atlanta boy car at the age of. And you said was, your mom, your mom encouraged or made you or encouraged she you? Made me. Yeah. She got me up Saturday morning and was like, yo, you got to go. You audition for the, so I sing. My country tis of these people. And they're like, right. okay, great. You're a first soprano. We need you. So that was how I started singing, man. And that was at the soprano. same age, nine, 10 years old? Something? No, that was actually before the drumming thing. It was right before oh, the drumming oh, okay. thing. So I was seven or eight, you know. Okay. Yeah. Right. So then, so I wasn't going to do the church choir. She made me do it on the boy choir. And then I became the drummer. You know, I was trying to find anything to be cool because, you know, you're from Texas. I'm from Georgia. When you're a young boy, you know, you want to be as far away from singing as you can because that's like so soft, you know. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I definitely, I definitely played pop Warner football growing up. You know, exactly. You know, it's, it's called balance, right? It's like if I'm going to be yeah. good at singing, I better justify myself somewhere else because you know, <laughs> which is so, it's so crazy. You know, no, nobody realizes that. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Um, do you realize what people really care about? Oh, when somebody can sing well, they like yeah. that. You know. They oh like yeah. That. Yeah, it took some time to understand that, you know. So, so at what point did um, did singing sort of take a more serious route for you? You know, man, it's really weird. Uh, it it took a more serious route when I got to high school because I was in the marching band playing the baritone horn. I didn't play. I played the drums at church and baritone horn and band. When did you start playing baritone horn? Uh, seventh grade. And was that again like your mom told you? Listen. Singing no. and drumming is not enough. You need to you need to play a brass instrument. <laughs> no, I was a drummer, and I was like, I didn't like doing all the rudiments and stuff because I was like boring. But yeah. no one at school could outplay me on the drums because I was a church drummer. And by that time, I was playing for like all these churches around the city. So uh, I was sitting next to you know the drummers are right next to the trumpets, and those guys are really cool. So I tried to play the trumpet, but you know when you got these big suit coolers like this, <laughs> <laughs> that little mouth, so. The band director was like, why don't you try this horn? So mm, there you go. So I, I started playing back from the horn. Wow. And uh, I'm going to segue really quickly. That band director was Mr. Reginald Colbert. His wife was Ms., Mrs. Colbert, and she was pregnant. Uh, she taught orchestra. He taught band, middle school. I actually sang with their son, who is now the bass, one of the basses for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I ran into oh, him in their VA. Yeah, so small work. But no, man, I started playing the back from the horn. Uh, and then when I got to high school, I was in the marching band, showed up early for marching band rehearsals, out in the sun, marching, formulating the big end for Northside. Got to the first football game, realized, why am I up here with these guys? You know, it's, all the cool guys are out there. So, And at, and at this point, um, you know, what, what are you, what, 6'6", six, 6'5"? Six, six, no, God, no, I'm 6'3". I'm six, three. You're 6'3"? Six, six, three. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, sometimes I say that I'm 6'3". I'm definitely not 6'3", if you're 6'3". Well, we're close though. I mean, you're a tall dude. Well, yeah, we're, we're 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 close, but I just feel like you're a, you're a mountain of a man. I feel <laughs> I feel very I feel very intimidated. Is the intimidated boys, in your presence. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, big, I mean, big old Texas boy. But no, um, when when did you hit that growth spurt? Uh, that happened sometime between eighth and ninth grade. Okay, like so, I you, was, so by the time you were in high school, you, yeah. I'm sure the football coach was like, "What's going on?" Well, yeah, you know, we were, I, went, I was 175 my eighth grade year, and I was six feet tall. My freshman year of Northside, I walked in at six, two-ish, 230, you what, know. What, what did you do over the summer? <laughs> right, just eat and play basketball and got bigger. Um, yeah. And then I just kept going, you know, I, I ended up graduating. Uh, actually, I didn't gain that much more weight. I just got more muscular. I went from like 225 to 240. I think I graduated about 245, 250. But uh, anyway, after that first f football game, I was like, you know what? I don't want to be in the band anymore. So I went to the band director and said, I'm hanging it up. I'm going to audition for the chorus because I went to a school of the arts. So I auditioned for the chorus full time. 
and I got in course full time so I could stay at that school and then I walked in the football team. So so you walked on and when you that was your junior year, sophomore year? Uh the it was actually the the spring ball of my freshman year. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly enough, spring ball of my freshman year is when I tore my MCL in my oh, right knee. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I was playing defensive end and uh I was going one way, somebody else cut me going the other way, and I was like, whoo. Uh, but yeah, okay. So you you got in there, and when you walked on, did you have an idea of um, where you wanted to play? What you, what position you wanted to? You were just like, this seems cool. I was like, yeah, let's just see what happens. You know, I, I knew that I played, I could play line, defense, offense. I was pretty quick. At least I thought I was, and I thought I was pretty tough. I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> right. You start you start hanging out with those guys. You're like. That guy yeah. can hit. Isn't that funny? It's like you do those you do those drills, you know, where you all the guys line up on other side and you go, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you start realizing like, oh, you, I don't want to go up against Morris. Like more that he'll, <laughs> he'll he, he hits hard. Well, I had to become that guy, but when I first started, man, I mean, I I they put me on like kickoff coverage uh on the scout team and not knowing they had a crisscross red wedge block on. So I'm flying down the field trying to make a play. I don't even see this guy coming. <laughs> Bam! It's like, shit. You know, it just, it happened to me over and over. But you know what? I was determined not to get punked out because I made the decision to go out there. And that's the right of passage. You know, you just, yeah, you know, yeah. the crazy part is that was my sophomore year going through all those grow, growing pains. I played JV and varsity at the same time. Uh, at yeah, the same they, time? Yeah. So we would have a game on Friday night. So I wouldn't get in much of those. But I started Saturday morning in the, in the B team games. So wow. double duty. Same time, I'm still doing music. I'm in the chorus. I made all state chorus that year. But uh, my junior year is when it really kicked in the high gear. We I got into the advanced chorus and we started doing things like the Mozart Requiem. And we auditioned for the solos and I got all the bass solos in the Mozart Requiem. So I'm I'm a I'm a junior in high school and I'm singing pretty much sounding about like that then, but uh <laughs> Not really understanding what I had, just right, you know, right. just like freak thing that I do. I'm on the football team, so yeah, I did that. My senior year, we did the Heidens Creation. I sing all the bass solos for that. Oh yeah, and they had a yeah. tour show. We had a touring company that did like you know events and festivals for IBM, Coca Cola. We go do like a, a a variety show for them. So had a sequence vest, tights, you know, go out and say hello, daughter, you know, all that stuff. Wow. So I don't know when I studied, but I was doing that. I was doing the other stuff, and I was playing football. That's that's my whole life, my senior year in high school. I hear you. And At that time, so I, I recovered from the, the MCL tear, but then when I came back, uh, a buddy of mine had transferred in from New Jersey, and he asked me, he was like, hey, do you guys have a lacrosse team here? And I was like, <laughs> oh, I go, a what? And he was like, he was like, yeah, lacrosse. And I was like, uh, I don't even know what that is, you know. And he was exactly. like, Oh, come over to come over to the house. Let me show you some videos. Uh, I think you'd like it. And so I was like, We have to have a lacrosse team. This is amazing. So I, he and I were the founders of our lacrosse team. And so my doctor, who wow. told me, he's like, You need to be careful with this MCL. We, I did like arthroscopic surgery, which mm -hmm. was just sort of, you know, it repaired yeah. it ish, you know. And and so I, I took that like as like, okay, I'm good to go. I can play lacrosse now. So I was doing I was doing the same similar thing where I was. I was a lacrosse player who had also made Texas All-State Choir, who was also singing solos, but also, that's interesting. That's oh, you interesting. know the whole thing. You you did the whole drill. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then at yeah. some point, at least for me, I was like, I mean, I, I even played lacrosse in college for two and a half, three years. Really? Um, yeah, like I went to a small private liberal arts university mm -hmm. at first that had a good team. And then I transferred to a big state school in Texas. That And I, and I eventually... For me, and I think for you too, music music ended up, you know, sort of taking yeah. over. But, but I know that you you did your undergrad at the Citadel, right? Sure did, yeah. So, yeah. so at some point, and you went, did you go there initially on a football scholarship to go play? I was on a football scholarship, yeah. That's where I so signed. At some point from the point that you walked on your freshman year uh, in the spring, those next three years must have hit something where it was like, oh, okay, this guy can play. Well, you know, I mean – Recruiting isn't wasn't then like it is now, but coaches came yeah. out and actually saw you play. And uh, I think I was playing against another school. They had like this all world running back, and they had an offensive lineman that ended up going to Georgia. And I didn't know this. I just knew I was out there playing the best I could, and I was 
I was knocking the crap out of the guys and had a great game. And they're like, hey, who's this guy? So school started noticing me. And I, I took recruiting trips to Southern Miss, West Georgia, Georgia Tech. Uh, Liberty wanted me, which I wasn't going to go there. But uh, in the Citadel, and I, I took the trip to the Citadel, and it was very mesmerizing to go on that campus, especially at night and see all the buildings lit up and yeah. the guys in uniform and, yeah. you know, the guys that really want to graduate. So I was like, you know what? This is more my environment because if I go here, I won't let my family down. I'll get out with a degree. So right, right, I took right. a football scholarship at Citadel. No music at all. I just, and my, you know, the guy that ran the music department was like, you're really making a big mistake. You know, your voice is so great. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to play football. The guy, the guy from, uh, the guy from high school. Yeah. Billy Dinsmore. He's actually pretty famous here. Uh, he started the Showbiz Kids, which is, you know, we did all the Coca-Cola commercials and jingles and stuff back in the day. Uh, okay. Like, I was oh, hey. in some of those recordings, yeah. Hey, uh, some guy named Lance Hansen says he was all right in football. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> great player and teammate. <laughs> so let me tell you about Lance Hansen. First of all, I'm a, I'm a sophomore. He's a freshman. He walks in. He walks in the first day and squats 545 pounds, right? <laughs> so he's... He's like this big redhead kid from Virginia Beach with no neck. Just looks like Frankenstein's monster. And so he was backing me up. I'm like, okay, this guy's going to take my job. I'm going to hold on as long as I can. Well, my, let's see, my senior year was his junior year. We both started. And he he went on to be like all world offensive guard. He was better than me, stronger than me, meaner than me, all that. But luckily I got out of the way before he started. So, yeah, he's my he's my teammate. He's one there of the meals. We played a lot of ball together, kicked a lot of butt together, and uh, he's well, wait, the coach so, right now. Were, were you playing offensive line? Yeah, we both played offensive guard. Yeah, offensive yeah. guard. Okay. Yeah, and I, I kind of shared my time between at the, you know for the time between offensive guard and defensive end, but yeah, that's interesting. You know, the thing that I and you know I think for people who are obviously even fans of football, they might understand how detailed or intelligent that offensive linemen actually have to be because there are, I mean, you laugh, but I'm saying like, you understand th there are so many rules that go, you know, depending on how the defense lines up, you got to yeah. change this to this. You got to alter, you know, there's so many different things that go along with it. Um, whereas, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, what, what are, what are well, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree. I tell people all the time that, uh, you know, people, they always talk about dumb, dumb jocks. There were no dumb jocks where I'm from, especially. And my son right now is taking a football first time in his life. And he never wanted to play football. He's like a computer nerd, you know, plays games. And the coaches love him because they say his football IQ is through the roof. What? Well, he's he's a smart kid. So, you know, when you play an offensive line, the guy's lined up in front of you. If he moves here, it changes everything. Exactly. And you need to know that. And I think that that's how I always make those parallels to fo from football to, this, to the art that we do. You know, you show up and you're prepared for a score and you get to the first rehearsal and the conductor's doing this. And then he says, no, change that to this. I'd rather have it this way. Right. Well, guess what? Right. You got to do it when? Yeah. Right now. You now. know, uh, right now. And uh, so the ability to reproduce and regurgitate and replicate quickly all came from that type of training because, you know, you have to be ready to go right on the spot. So there are lots of parallels we can talk about later, but I think that one definitely prepared me for the other. Yeah, so. no kidding. It's funny. The, 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 uh, an instant that I just rem was was reminiscent of was, you know, our, our colleague, Carrie Alkema. I don't know how, if you're friends with Carrie or not, but, you know, she and Sandra Ravanovsky do that uh, uh, Screaming Divas uh, podcast. Okay. And uh, Carrie, Carrie and I were doing a production of Maria Stuarda together um, at Seattle Opera. In Seattle, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, Carlo Montanaro was conducting and uh, she was singing one of the Queen, the Queen uh, she wasn't singing Stuart, she was singing Queen. And um, she had this cadenza, you know, that she had planned mm -hmm. and, and, and prepared. And in the moment, Montanaro looked at her and she was, he was like, mm, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I can only imagine, I mean, you know, from time to time, we might have some some decent cadenzas that we work out, but not like right, the right. do, right? And so she, she, she held her own. She was like, <laughs> well, wait a minute now. You know, uh, yeah, don't you want yeah. to? I, I think that there should be a difference between Queen Elizabeth and and Suarda. You know, yeah. there needs to be. There's needs to be. And he's like, yeah, but why? You know, I don't know. And, and so, but yeah, exactly. It's like being able to be spontaneous and work on the fly, and being able to um, in, in live performance. You know, live in performance. live performance. Yeah. Right. What if the, right. the conductor had too much coffee? You know, or 
he wakes up in a different mood. Or playing you know? to catch. Playing to catch, or right? Playing to catch, you know? <laughs> It's like, or they don't want to play the orchestra overtime tonight. Like, you know, so. Yeah, the stage manager yeah. goes, oh, we, we, we somehow seem to tr uh, sh tread, uh, seem to shed like 14 minutes off of today's performance. Exactly. Huh. Or, can we do that again? Or you have a, you walk in and there's a new tenor that shows up or a new, you know, so the ability to be flexible, change on the fly, coachable when you're in coach, all those things I think are parallel, what I call transferable skills that I learned from one to the other so absolutely yeah. absolutely i know i'm way, jumping ahead but yeah no 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 julian robbins uh julian hello. julian i love that man what an incredible, i love that man you know what's funny uh so uh one of the um one of the amazing operas I, I feel like you know there are suit there are maybe a handful of roles that you mm -hmm. just when you get the opportunity to perform them it's kind mm -hmm. of like the skies open up and it's just like wow how I, so for me, that has been Scarpia. I realize that, like, you know, my voice category might not be the number one first choice for that role. I can't, mm -hmm. same thing with Rigoletto. You know, I can't count the number yeah. of times that somebody has said, like, ah, oh, his voice, I mean, and I, I'm, you get it, but I'm not trying to give myself a compliment, but they say, oh, his voice is too beautiful to sing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, more, it needs to be more gruff. Guy. It needs to be more guy. gruff. It needs to be more whatever. But, yeah. but you know, I certainly, can make an argument for why Rigoletto needs to be sung beautifully. And I can certainly make an argument why Scarpia needs to be, you know, sung beautifully. But, but Julian Robbins, when we met, he was my sacristan. And um, we, we had a hell of a time there. <laughs> you know, Julian game. was, uh, he, he, he and Jim Courtney were like two of my guys that were at the Met when I was a young artist. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they were the old artists and I was a, I was a young artist. And they I think he's been, a, I think he's been a playing artist since like 19, you know, Oh, four. Since we, yeah, you know. since we were like talking, <laughs> since we were playing high school ball. Yeah. Um, but the stories this guy has, the, ve the wealth of knowledge, and every time I've heard Julian Robbins see, he still sounds like he's 45 years old, man. It's just like, dude, you ever. It's amazing. Me, so. it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, amazing. It's yeah, amazing. Also, some... Fr Francisco de la Torre, who's a huge opera fan. Of he course. Saw yeah. you, he saw you spot a Fuchile in LA, and yeah. he, says, he says you remind him of Siepi. I don't know if oh, there's wow. a better. I don't know if there's a better compliment than that, man. My God. You Thank know, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I know, right? Brian, <laughs> Brian Email and I um, mm. have a, a show that we do on Saturdays called The Listening Lab, where okay. we go through and, and, and feature a particular recording that was meaningful to us when we mm. were coming up and, you know, learning new roles and stuff. And, and we were talking about, like, different artists that we want to highlight. And Siepi... You know, we were like, we got to do his Giovanni. Like, Siepi's Giovanni is unreal. Other world, yeah. You know, he, he passed away here in Georgia. Did he really? He was living in, I think he was living in Marietta, Georgia when he, when he was married and stuff. And uh, I was a young artist living in New York. And I was like, the one thing I'm going to do is find this guy when I get there. And I think he passed away right before I moved here, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Never got to meet that guy. What a legend, huh? What a, what a I mean, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's amazing when you, when, you, when you think about that. I mean, they call it the golden age of singing for a reason, I guess, but I don't know. Um, yeah. the, the amount of singers, I mean, in the in the bass repertoire with like Giorgio Tozzi and Cesare Siepi and... Uh, Bernardo Giotti. There you go. Yeah. Who, who were some of your idols that you kind of grew Bernardo up with? Bernardo Giotti. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he, he's like the one that slept on. But if you ever listen to him, like when I was doing my first Zacharia in the Buco, I put that recording on and went... <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm not as good as I thought I was, you know? but just you know that openness, that open throat. That just you know all this stuff that we, you know, I try to coach it out myself, and you know we we get into the this uh, this finessing thing a lot. And at the end of the day, those guys just walked up and gave you voice, you know, and they sang with expression and emotion. But at the end of the day, you were going to hear them at the back of the house. So that's what you paid for. And when he walked oh. on stage, he was this tall. But that gummit boy, that's some old school stuff there. You think about the difference in the way that those folks were trained as opposed yeah. to how we we are trained now. Yeah. I mean, th those folks were truly apprenticed by their teachers where they spent, you know, multiple days in a week, you know, working yeah. with them and coaching with them and having an opportunity to just sort of be around. And um, mm -hmm. you speaking, speaking of that, talk to me a little bit. Tell us, tell us a little bit about um, once you started to, uh, I mean, I mean, you had all this musical experience. Then you went to the Citadel. You started playing football. Then yeah. when, when did music or singing come back into your life in a major way? Well, it was always in my life that even at Citadel, I was, I was, uh, 
singing the national anthem at sporting events. I was singing the cadet chorale. I was in the gospel choir, but I mostly conducted and played for the gospel choir. But, you know, guys were here that I could sing on campus. There was a, we had a Christmas candlelight service every year. And the highlight of the service every year was some cadet got up and sang Oh Holy Night. And so my freshman had said, oh, you know, you're a knob. So I'm just trying to be unnoticed. And uh, this one kid got up and sang Oh Holy Night. And I looked at that. And, and you said, were like, I can, I can do that better. I literally was thinking to myself, oh, that's his last time doing this. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I was like, like yeah, 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 that's not going to cut it. So <laughs> I literally went to the band director and he had introduced me to the chorus guy. And they said, well, let me hear it. You know, and I just started singing. And the whole cadet chorale was like, so that was it. It was my job for the rest of my time there. And that, that kind of put me on the map at the in that part, you know, not, not the football field, but that. So I was always doing it. Um, and then when I graduated, you know, all my teammates wanted me to sing the Lord's Prayer and stuff at their weddings. So I was just booked, singing for free for all these guys. But I mean, were you were you in any kind of like formal lessons or I mean, were you were you studying voice? This is this is just natural talent with uh, passion mixed in, but not any kind of training at this point. I never took a voice lesson in my whole entire life until I got the Opera Institute. 30 ever. Dude, okay. I mean, not that I've done a million of these, but you are the first person that I've spoken with who had not had any formal private one-on-one -on -one voice lesson until they were 30. 30, man. That's insane. Okay, so so you you graduated from <clears throat> at what, 23, 22? 20, 22, 22, 22, yeah. 22 yeah. yeah. Yep. And then, that then was what? 1991, uh, December of 91. I took me an extra semester. I was a ball player, you know, took my time getting out of there. But, you know, I was <laughs> You're like, all right, I'm on the plan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Plan. yeah. So I graduated in December 91, bounced at clubs, audition, audition, interview for jobs, got a job at 3M in Minnesota, started working there in June of 92. Um, was doing no singing at all, except for weddings, of course. Um, moved to Northern Virginia in 92, 93. Where, where in Northern Virginia? Woodbridge. My, my wife grew up in Reston. Would that oh, that's on the other side. Yeah, on the other side of, uh, that's by the okay. town center, over by Dulles Airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Spent a lot of time over there. That's where George George Mason University was, and all that stuff. Right. not too far from there, Fairfax. Right. Yeah, so I was in the area covering all the D.C. accounts, Virginia accounts, and uh, I remember, you know, it was always a question, was I going to go back to law school, or was I going to go back and, and study, you know, do something with music? I didn't know what to do. So I think it's like 1995-ish when Denise said to me, uh, you got an audition with this chorus at one o'clock, so you need to get ready. It's Saturday morning. What do you mean? You know, so she set up an audition for me, you know, behind my back. So I went and sang for the Norman. And who's Sprinter. Denise? Who's Denise? <laughs> oh, I said. <laughs> so we, uh, we, she set this up for me and I go to, uh, she said, look at me now. I go to, what's it called? Sam Ash, I think it is. The music store. Yeah, Sam Ash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick up a score of the of the Mozart Requiem, and go to this audition and say, "Hey, I want to see the two of from Mozart Requiem." Because you had done that before, back in high school. In high school, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, Jim Grady says Morris did Brazilian jujitsu with me back in the day. Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, I got choked. I got choked out by Jim Grady. Uh oh. <laughs> no, he's my he's my jujitsu teacher, and he's also my uh, what do you call it? He was my foodie. We used to eat foodie at all times. So there you go. What's up, there Jim? No, so I go and see the the Mozart Requiem. I see him the tuba mirror for this guy, and he goes, "What are you doing here?" You know, he had like this freak out reaction, whatever. So it's cool. Um, and I guess at that point, I realized that maybe I'm onto something, you know, I don't know, but, uh, when, when some of the stat, like when you're singing the, the Lord's prayer at a church and some old lady says, you have a voice that you should be using it for a living. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so yeah, much. Well, thank you. you don't, you have no idea. I, when, yeah. When Norman Scribner says, I've never had a voice like this walk into my audition before in my life, you go, Really? Okay. So Why would you, you just, say that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Hmm. So yeah, that's where it just the ball started kind of rolling. Uh that maybe we're on to something special here. Yeah. But I only stayed there for a few more months, man. And then I left there and went to uh I went to I took another job up in the New England area. 
working for Exxon in Monsanto, division of Exxon in Monsanto. Still, and, uh, never, never a voice lesson. No, I'm just singing. He's taking me around singing for the Congressional Black Caucus. You know, oh, say can you see all that stuff? Uh, you know, oh, he introduced me to Todd Duncan, okay. who was 92 years old, and I wouldn't have had a couple coaches with him, so I did have two two coaches with Todd Duncan. You know, he was, and uh, just trying to fill me out and see what I could do, and trying to give me an idea of what I could do. But you know, he just I remember one one time he played dun 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 dun. dun. And he's like, do you know what that is? I was like, no, sir. He's like, that's a song called Old Man River. And I know a guy who had a voice just like yours and made a lot of money singing that. You should learn it. So he was talking about Paul Robeson, who was his colleague, you know? So, of course, yeah. Yeah, man. So that I went to New England and uh, I'm working. Before I, moved, before I even got there, we were riding downtown looking for a place to stay. Passed by the New England Conservatory of Music. And I'm like, okay, that's what it is. And he's just like, you should go in and get an application. I was like, I ain't doing it. You know, because why, you know? So I got it anyway. And uh, she stopped I the went, car and said, get out and go get it. <laughs> I, well, I was driving, but yeah, it was kind of like that. So <laughs> I went and got the application. They had a thing called continuing education. I sang for that. I uh, went and auditioned for them singing the national anthem. And they said, you should do an opera studio. So got into a scenes program with them. I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, what was the guy's name? Tim Scott, I think it was, uh, one of the coaches there, taught me everything about syllable. You know, I'm learning how to do these things under the scene. You make your own costumes, you show up on the weekends. And that's where Sharon Daniels heard me. Sharon and Daniels, who was at the time, I think, the director of the Opera Institute. Opera right? Institute, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Sharon came in and she, she heard me sing. I was in a, I got to just play this, uh, this musical called St. Noah by Michael Balfe. And um let's see i walk into the my first scene was i walk into the back of the church and it's uh what daring mortals you found my name or something like that you know it's kind of it's a loud big entrance and after the show she kind of walked up to me and said you know i've never heard anything like this you know off the street but i think i can make room for you in my program if you learn go learn five arias blah 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 come back and sing for me in the spring so that's when i got done wilkinson she recommended that I start studying with him. And he taught me all my arias and gave me voice lessons. And uh, I went and sang for her in the spring. But what year uh, was that? I started studying with him December, January of 90, December 98, January of 99. So, right? so did you end up doing the Opera Institute? So I got, well, I auditioned for them in the spring and they, get, they took me in. So that was my first. That was my official start of studying music, uh, wow. the fall of 99. And that Dude, was you, know who, you know who else was um, asked to join the Opera Institute in the fall of 99? Are you serious? <laughs> I ended up going to Indiana University because I was so scared about being able to find housing opportunities uh, yeah. for whatever reason. It was crazy. I lived, in New, I lived in New Hampshire, man. It was... I commuted 53 miles each way every day because I don't wow. have a there. But yeah, this is a sacrifice you make, you know, but uh, Boston was, that's the reason we had been in New Hampshire because Boston was too expensive, you know? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's unreal. I mean, so what, do you remember any of the, the surprises or the, um, the technical difficulties that you initially faced when you started studying formally? Technical difficulties. Well, I didn't know. I'd never sung in any language other than Latin with, with the very direct, you know, the Mozart Requiem. Mozart, yeah. And the first assignment they gave me was Bluebeard and Bluebeard's Castle, but it was in English. So the first thing I had to do, well, you know, I learned the arias. The first thing I had to do was just learn languages, learn how to pronounce it, learn how to sing it, learn how to, you know, how the language ebbed and flowed, just all that. So I was basically learning everything by syllable and just trying to learn how to pronounce it correctly. So I had, I had a lot of help there. I had Sandy Eddy was there. Sandra Diethos was there. Yeah. Allison Trainer was there. You know, Eris Allison Trainer. Stephen Humes was the bass that was there already. Daniel Brenna. And those cats were always like, you know what, man? Come here, sit down with the piano. Let me show you something. So they were always trying to help. And then I auditioned for the Boston Lyric Opera. They had, you know, they they took us in as choristers and stuff. And Stephen Lord heard me and offered me the King and Aida. So wow. that was a... That was the beginning wow. of it all. Yeah. That's amazing. 
That's you know who else was there? Spate. Spate Jenkins? He was at the opening night. Wow. He walked up and offered me the he offered me the buns after the show, my first show. Out in Seattle. Yeah, same buns in Seattle at, uh, two years later. Wow. Yeah. What an incredible progression. I mean, talk about, you know, when something is meant to be, it's meant to be, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can't you can't write the script. You can't, you know, it's it was I feel like I for whatever reason I was able to find what I was put on earth to do, you know? I, I hear you. Yeah. Hey, listen, I've never done this. Uh, this is like this is like episode uh oh, I don't know, 30 something for me. Yeah. I was so excited to get on with you. Uh I didn't really have a chance to use the restroom before I got on. Ah! We're gonna we're gonna take a brief intermission. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a brief. I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm just gonna run to the restroom real quick. I'm gonna be back in like two seconds. Why don't you refresh your Chick-fil-A cup? And uh, I, I, give me give me four seconds. I'll be right I'm gonna, back. I'm gonna cut both of them off. Okay, I'll be right back. All right, I'm back whenever you are. My goodness. Uh, I'm back. What's up, man? Man, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Wait, so, you know, when you got to go, you got to go. And we 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 got this gray in our beard now. So it's like, you know, right. once this starts well, happening, you we can't were, hold We were talking, I know, right? We were talking about, um, you know, having to sort of improvise on the fly, whether you're on the offensive line or whether you're on the operatic stage. I'll tell you what, it, it brings to mind a uh, memory when I was making my debut with the Spoleto USA Festival. We were doing a piece. Julius Riddell was in the pit. Oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, we were singing a, um, an American premiere, not the world premiere, but the American premiere of uh, Walter Braunfels' Die Vögel, The Birds. And um, in that opera, I was cast as the role of Wiedhoff, which was the king of the birds. And there was um, the nightingale was sort of the main dramatic color to a soprano part. And then uh, Dale Travis was the uh, one of the human beings that was like, Dale. yeah, right. <laughs> Dale. Yeah. So good. And. Um, uh, oh, God. Who, no, oh, man, he's going to kill me. There was a tenor who uh, was fantastic, who's based in Vienna. Um, it's like right on the tip of my tongue, like a Heldon tenor. Uh, uh so th th those were the two human beings and then everybody else was pretty much a bird well anyway yeah. at, the at the end of the opera all the birds die and we're sitting there on this rake stage which was a pretty significant rake and i'm laying there and i my role was pretty significant i was out there pretty much the whole time and i was laying there on this rake stage and i was like i gotta pee what am i gonna do <laughs> it was terrible and i was like all this build up. <laughs> I got all this build up, right? And it's like, I got I gotta go. I can't I can't pee here on stage. We're on a rake stage. It's gonna go down into the pit. This that would be is terrible. My biggest I'm, freaking nightmare, dude. Here it was in real life. Okay. Talk about lifting the veil under the hood. I'm sitting there on stage, laying down, supposed to be dead. <clears throat> and I and I was like, All right, I'm just gonna get up and leave. So I stood up and I walked off stage. And the stage manager looked at me, she, 
what are you doing? What are you doing? And I was like, I got to pee. And so she was like, well, go. And so I went over and then I was like, all right, all right. I finished, I came back on stage and she, you know, she looked at me like, I don't know. I walked back out on stage. I laid back down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story, man. Okay. In my mind, you can only, this is my debut. In my mind, oh. I'm like, I'm like, That's it. I'm done. That's it. I'm done. I'll never be hired in this industry yeah. again. It's going to yeah. be. It, 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 and so, you know, all these people were there for it, right? The American premiere, the oh. film, whatever. I started talking to people like, yeah, oh, they're like, oh, beautiful job. Oh, so beautiful. You know, did you, did you notice anything weird kind of there at the end? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, like, I don't know. Did you notice anything that was kind of like, well, what's he doing? <laughs> And they're like, no, what happened? Did the tenor, did the tenor like crack or something? I, I don't know what happened, what happened? I go, you didn't see me get up and leave and then come I was back? Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, no, I didn't. And that's where I started to realize, which is actually really important to this conversation. So much of what we do as singers, we get in our own heads about, right? Oh, that vowel, that vowel. Oh, it was on an E flat. It should have been turned over a little bit more. Oh, oh, that, oh now it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound like crap. I sounded terrible on that. No, no, you didn't. No, over. no, no yeah. one saw me get up to go pee yeah. at the end of the, yeah. the, end of the show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, was talking with, I was talking with Tony Moore yesterday and we were talking about this whole streaming thing versus recording versus live theater. Yeah. And the beauty yeah. of live theater is once you do it, it's over. Like, you know, now they just have a recollection of their memory, but now with everything documented, it makes you even more stressed out about perfection. Right. So I just gotta get over it, man. You know, I've done enough in this business as have you where, you know, if we have a bad outing, we just had a bad outing. We, we probably right. have more than they think about, but you know, we have so many good ones. So right, yeah, I just, right, right. I can't, we can't get in our own head, man. We got to operate and sing to the house and sing for the moment and let the cameras do what they're gonna do. I don't care about the camera anymore. That's I kind know. of my mindset, yeah. I know, I yeah. know, I know. Speaking of, Latonya says, hey. Oh, what's up? I was just talking about you, see? There you go. I know, right? See, Sarah Spicer says hello. Hey, so Sarah. Good see, so good to see both of you Wolf Trap alums. Yeah, I uh, know. Yeah. Hey, you know who else I saw in there was Kelly Gebhardt. She used to be married to Chuck Taylor. Remember Chuck? I knew Chuck. I, that was Kelly the baritone Gep that was there when you didn't come, man. I know. Kelly Gebhardt was one of my ex-girlfriends. She and I dated <laughs> way back in the day. Way All right, back I'm not in into this. I'm not into this. <laughs> but Chuck, now that was a monster of a voice. I remember when he showed up. I was like, dude. Man. <laughs> yeah. Man, I'll tell you what, when when I heard Chuck sing for the first time, I was literally like, Yeah. How, oh, that's what I want to sound like. Like, how do you do that? Like it's I was at Sissy Sprouse's house and we were, you know, he wasn't even a young artist then. He was just this is big Chuck, not little Chuck, big Chuck. Ponytail. I, I hear you. And uh you know, I did my thing. You know, a couple of people got to sing, and then he stood up and sang. We were like, I was like, where did this guy come from? You know, it's, it's supposed to be my show. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we, we were great, man. He was like Miles' godfather that he never met, you know, because. Right, right, right. You right. Know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I remember I did, uh, he and I were double cast together as Germont and Traviata. And uh, I remember walking in and I walked right by him. And this is, this is Little Chuck. And <laughs> I walked right by him. I didn't even know. He recognized him. And he goes, he goes hurt, and I and I was like, "Oh, hey." Um, he goes, "Who are you?" Chuck, it's me, Chuck, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, it <laughs> where's the rest unreal. of you? Real, yeah. unreal. Yeah. What, what, yeah. what an incredible. Okay, so Latanya yeah. has a question. What's up? How do you roll your R's? Oh, Latanya, please. <laughs> See, she trying to put me on the spot. She know the trick, man. So here's the thing. Here's a real story. When I was at the Opera Institute and I'm learning how to do all these things, you know, you're a young artist. You only hear what you do badly. So, you know, I'm, I'm so in, inundated with things I need to work on. But one thing I thought I did really well was make a good R sound. So I would be like, you know, Ascoltare. It sounds right, right? Except it ain't. So if you're really close to me, you can hear that the sound isn't in the front. It's You do a uvular R. I do a uvular R, yeah. But I've gotten to the point where I can make the sound sound like it's projected. And this, whoever this girl was, this lady was, said, if you don't learn how to fix your arts, you'll never have a career. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't remember who she was, but whoever you were, thank you very much for motivating me to prove you wrong because 
that was the meanest thing I ever heard. And that was the one thing that motivated me to say, I don't care what happens. I'm going in for this thing. So do you yeah. still roll your R's with your uvula? Right now, every day. Every day. Okay. All the time. So, so Pitas, Dimitri Pitas says, biggest uvula in the business. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, but as far as somebody being able to do something you wouldn't think that you'd be able to do, you know, everybody talks about singing from your diaphragm, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. that boy, when he fell off the horse on his honeymoon and realized that, you know, he had the cancer and he had to get the surgery and everything done, he has and meets. I apologize if I'm spilling the beans on this or what, but I think everybody loves and knows you so well. And I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know. Yeah, I know. There's something about how his diaphragm isn't even connected to one of his, I don't know, it's some, some kind of partial thing where it's yeah. like, no, 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 no. Like what you're saying doesn't even, doesn't even match. So it, it, it doesn't matter if you roll your R's with your uvula or if your <laughs> diaphragm's not completely, you know, attached. It's it like, is, if yeah. you can sing, you can sing, you know what you I mean? You sing, you sing, you know, and, that's the crazy part. Like people get so caught up in academia on these my, on the minutia of things that they think should go a certain way. When in actuality, the people that are doing it will tell you it works. Do it, you know. So exactly, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, breathing is definitely important. I think that you can fix a lot of things with breathing. But you know, I've never been the type of person that expands here and you fill it in the back and you in the tarsals. And all. I never did all that. I just go, you know, <laughs> take a deep breath and give it a shot, you know, so it's well, about other, So let's say this, other than whatever you brought to the game, because it sounds like it was a lot, like whatever yeah. you brought to the game that was instinctual and natural and based on the sounds that you heard, whether it was in the church or on recordings, what were some of the technical things that you had to really struggle with yeah. that you didn't initially sort of get? So I always had a decent voice, you know, low to middle, middle upper up to about C natural D. But then, you know, I was learning things like Vecchiati Marra Senti and the infamous passage that makes every bass nervous. Pa, sa, ra, nele, tu, ta, Which starts on a what, like, E flat? E flat, yeah. And I just, I could sing an E natural, but I could not sing an E flat. And of course, I don't know how this mechanism works. I just know that my natural instinct when I get to E natural is this way. But when I'm at E flat, this doesn't work. It's like, what the heck? So I had to learn how to turn the voice. I had to learn what the passages was. I had to learn that I had two passages and how to narrow the vowels going up. So, you know, you start out here, hourglass, back open, you know, the same thing. So I had to learn all those things and learn how to correctly navigate that, which I had. And one of the best things I heard was my first year at the Met program, uh, this guy named uh, Eric Halverson came to my first recital. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. I've heard of him. This guy, you know, he just shows up. So I don't know who he is, but after the show, Mr. Robinson, I'm like, okay, he must be a singer. He says, I want to say a few things to you. You have a magnificent voice, but there's some aspects of your voice where you sound like a really great bass and a very bad baritone. I was like, <laughs> okay. Right, but he's right. You know, so I, that was the hard thing, just learning how to carry the colors and the depth and, and the darkness all the way up through the range. And to the point I've studied so much with Mark to get it right that people now just talk about how great my high notes are which is really interesting because i had to work really hard to get that right you know but yeah, i can mark mark oswald you're talking about mark oswald yeah yeah and yeah. so i'm saying these things that people know they are so. no no no. well i just you know just for anybody who might be watching that, that's unfamiliar yeah. you know eric halverson I, I when i first heard him sing i was like is he mic'd he's mic'd. Yeah, exactly I'm he, see level he, stage. his voice is like right here on your shoulder 100 percent of the time I'm on a sea level stage. My first year as a young artist, and I'm working with, uh, I'm working with, uh, I'm in a German coaching, I think, with uh, it ain't the Spiegelman. And I walk out. I'd never heard Spotted for Chile song before, but I knew they were doing it. Uh, Rigoletto on sea level stage. This is this probe. And I walk in, and I I walk out, and I hear it go. Spiegel! I was like, who the fuck? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I was like, the hell is that? And I walk out, and this this little short guy with this beautiful E just, oh, and I was like, holy cow, that thing is piercing throughout the whole building. Right. Okay, right. so this is what it takes to be that good. Okay, I got it. So, you know, but that's the beauty too. You know, when we were coming up, man, we had so many people we could look up to and yeah. pinch off of, so. Yeah. Oh my God, I, I tell the story oftentimes, when I, when I was a winner in the uh, Leech Albanese, who I think Latanya was actually there with me that year. I don't know, it must have been like 2000. Yo, winning all the money, man. I wouldn't win for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember we it was the 50th anniversary, and so we were doing the, the winner's concert with the orchestra of St. Luke's. 
And I remember that they, you know, Lita, she did it out right. She had all the everybody who's ever she's had sung with or met or anything, they all came wow. back. And so I think we, we were doing act three of La Boheme with the orchestra and I was singing Marcello. And I remember kind of just sitting there backstage, getting my thoughts together. And I looked up and I kid you not, Cheryl Milnes, Leo Nucci, <laughs> Thomas Hampson, Oh, like, Lord. Leo, Leo Nucci was there. He he started the whole thing with Largo a Factorum when he was like, you know, I mean, there's tons of videos of him online on YouTube singing it. At I like sang with years him. Old. I sang with him. Unbelievable. In Rigoletto or what? Nabucco at the Met. I was high priest of ball and he was singing Nabucco. And I forgot who was singing before. I was Lado Atanelli was singing before. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it was yeah. good. I mean, he, this guy's great until Leo Nucci showed up. <laughs> and then yeah. you can see it was like Ray Chetto was covering Zacharia. Yeah, Sam yeah. Raymond was singing. I was singing my role. I forgot who was covering me. Uh, you know, Julian Robbins was there. We were all there. And when Leo sang, we literally like had our notepads out going, okay, cover that, you know, open wow. the you know? Wow. It was like a voice lesson for everybody in the house. And he was like 63 then. Well, you know, there's a great, there's a great uh, uh, video of him on YouTube where it's like someone asked him, you know, Maestro, Maestro, where do, where do you start to cover? And he goes over to the keyboard and he's like, you know, this low E, right? Which is, so in a sense, every note that I sing is purposefully sung, purposefully in, sung yeah. in, in the turn yeah. or yeah. covered so that you would never go, bah, but yeah. bah, right? There's there's a yeah. certain type of color or sound and you yeah. know, and, and you hear that in his singing from top to bottom, but. That um, was a crazy voice, man, Jesus Christ. But while that I was, was standing good. there, literally like Thomas Hampson, uh, Leo Nucci, Cheryl Milnes, uh, who else was it? There were, there were oh, 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 Robert Merrill was standing there. So are you like, I should just quit now? Because <laughs> I, I literally thought, I was like, am I dead? Like, what is happening right now? And uh, hey, and, and they called us to stage and they, they were all kind of like, hey, toy, toy, toy. And I was like, I think I laughed. I was like, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go sing Marcello, who all of you have sung and recorded about a hundred times at, over. At know. every major venue in the world, by the way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah. It's well, you know, but those, but what I learned about those cats, and that's one of the reasons I try so hard to be giving, those guys, they weren't jealous. They never felt threatened. They never felt uneasy. They loved to see young guys good. I, like, I felt like they just gave me everything they could. I remember working with Kurt Paul right. and Eric Halverson and, and uh, Robert Lloyd. Oh, you Robert know, Lloyd. Ray, yeah. Rainey, yeah, yeah. And he, you know, almost contemporaneous was me and this guy named Renee Papa, who was at the height of his thing. And I was just coming up, you know, I was doing the coaching on something one day and he just walked in the room and I'm like, okay, now I'm supposed to keep singing, you know, and he walked in, or uh, how do you do your E natural? Well, I, you know, so now we're comparing notes and stuff. It was crazy, man. So these guys, always showed love they always gave you know you're around there when all this was happening those old yeah, cats yeah. That we were talking about earlier julian uh you know uh jim courtney so i i loved and appreciated that because it helped me it gave me so much more confidence and i tried to do the same to young singers now so that's God bless all those guys yeah well you said you know that mark oswald really helped you open up your top i mean yeah. you know i i think that it's no secret that you know he teaches um a, a method that is very uh, specific, right? I mean, you know, I've sat in on a few of those lessons over the years and, and I certainly have taken away, you know, that it's the idea, you know, depending on where you are in your range, it's a different adjustment of a vowel towards a different thing. I mean, what that, that had to have been a different change or a different ideology to what you had come in before that, right? It was totally different. And I was working with Joanna Levy while I was at Opera Institute. That was my first teacher. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Joanna, God rest her soul, was like, she's great. And she knew what she was doing. And she knew I was raw. And she was really working on connecting me and just teaching me, you know, giving me the confidence to make some beautiful sounds. Yeah. And I remember at one of my last lessons with her, right before I auditioned for the Met Young Artist Program, she says, you know what, we're done. She says, you need to go find the next level person. And I was like, right. what? <laughs> she's like, no, suck it up. This is how it works. Yeah. She says, if I want to be greedy, I would keep you to myself, but you need to go do this. And that's when I, you know, I got to the Met program and they turned me on this guy, Cat Mark Oswald. And, you know, it was like real technical, man. It was like, okay, but I'm going to stay with this. And I had two lessons a week for four years. Two lessons a week. Two lessons I mean, a week, almost four years. You, you really, really rarely see that opportunity. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's and, great and in the world, man. The once you, covered all that stuff. 
No, I know. I mean, how incredible, incredibly fortunate um, yeah. that, that those who they covered I, it the three years I was there. Right. And then my the year after I left, they continued to pay for my lessons. That's amazing. So that's you know that people talk about Morris Robinson having this freak voice and he doesn't have to work really hard. He just opens his mouth and it comes out. No, 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 no. Anyone that listens to me saying knows I know what I'm doing. Now, I'm not yeah. bragging, but that's just the facts. You know, well, you don't get to where you are if you don't know what you're doing. I'm sorry. You better know what you're doing. You better yeah. know how to get through the facade. You, you need to know. So I learned, I studied my butt off. And I think that, you know, that that cerebral way to think when approaching the voice is back to the offensive line days. You know, you're not just a dumb jock that goes out there and goes off on people. You got to know where you're going. You got to know what the play is, what my first step is, what angle I better take. It's the same thing with my team. So yeah. I don't just wake up in the morning and holler. Don't no, get I, couldn't agree. I, I no. couldn't agree more. And, and for someone who, uh, in, a, in a different way, had a very natural talent, it wasn't until I started to have a bit more specificity thrown in my direction yeah. with, with, okay, sure. You can, you can sing, you know, you can sing an E natural, you know, this, this E natural, um, yeah. in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. But, uh, if you think about how you refine your vowel in a certain way and how you adjust that so that if you if you happen to do, you know, a, if, if the vocal line calls for, you know, what is, how, how are you going to sustain that? How is that gonna be able to match? And I think at the end of the day, that type of um, specificity in, in how, how to, I mean, what's the goal at the end of the day from the top of the range to the bottom of the range to have a seamless you're, you're not riding in an old vw bug with a stick yeah. shift you're yeah. riding in a you know bentley that you don't ever even feel the gear shift right yeah. it's seamless from top to bottom and For young um, kids, you want to sound like the same person from bottom to top and back down and exactly. how do you do that you know so yeah that's that's what we're aiming for that's what people listen for that's that line not just the legato line but the voice being lined up you know they talk about that all the time and once you crack that code, you, you've arrived, you know. Hey, uh, Rafael Porto, who was a young bass baritone that I had uh, interviewed within this month of the basement, um, hey. ju just to ask, can you talk a little bit about the work-life balance with traveling so much, having a family, um, or how you are able to feel at home when you're on the road? Okay, well, he also mentioned Kevin Short, so I got to give a shout out. Oh, to he him. did, yeah, 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 yeah. he yeah. said. Talk, talk about freak voices like that, dude, you know, it's, that's other world, you know. He can sing anything you sing, anything I sing, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. as well as both of us, right? So, but no, it's kind of crazy. It is crazy. No, you know, Weston. You know, when you when you're hitting it like we're hitting it, and been blessed enough to do it, there is no balance. I mean, you try, but you know, with with technology, you know. Can you okay? Let, let's let's take a second. If you were to have this career 30, 40 years ago, I mean, how many children do you have? one okay i do too yeah. but that yeah. alone i mean well never mind the the importance of a of a supportive spouse but the child the relationship you have with your child i have a daughter i cannot imagine running out of rehearsal trying to find a payphone you know what i mean like the fact that we can just pick up you know pick up our phones and and facetime or whatever it's unreal so yeah technology, my, of course my kid has me doing i was in la last year and he had some kind of math problem <laughs> He FaceTime me. I'm sitting there. You know how you're sitting at the table waiting for your scene to come up? Yeah. So I said, take a screenshot of it. I took a screenshot of it, blew it up and said, hey, who's good at math? We're all in rehearsal doing his math homework because, you know, <laughs> it certainly is a supportive group around you as well, but there's no way to replicate family life at home. I mean, I mean, away from home, but yeah. technology certainly does help balance it out. This year yeah. has been a silver lining as far as, you know, having be, been forced to not be on the road you know so it's uh it's yeah. changed changed all that you know the whole aspect of that whole thing so yeah, yeah. no yeah good I, question absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's a great question Raphael. thomas thomas cochran uh said he liked my my bentley voice uh well you know when you're when you're talking about morris robinson i, I mean what 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 in your <laughs> mind you're you're a car guy listen the first time that i ever met you uh -oh. was when larry brownlee and i from indiana university drove out to st louis and we went to we went to see. I remember there was a Boem that was going on. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Cal Kettleson, Lester Lynch. All that. I was in the court. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we went out there, and I remember 
Larry was like, oh, Weston, me and my friend Morris, you had like a black Escalade. You were like, I just, again, I just thought you were like, in my mind, you're like seven, three, you know, like, I just, <laughs> feel like, I don't know. Uh, I was we'll like, see. who is this guy who had, I, that, I had at that time, I had the Yukon Denali. Okay. Right? Okay. Maybe it was the Yukon. And then, and then the next year I came with a black, black Suburban. So oh, there you go. There you go. But see, you all, I, I worked beforehand. I wasn't like a, you know, well, I we didn't know that. I didn't know that. I was like, "Damn, where is this guy singing? I need to get that gig." <laughs> I was in the chorus, man. In fact, I had the one word "oranges." Oh, right. That guy was. That was my whole rolling bow. That's amazing. Go figure. Are you a car guy? Are you? Are you? A, what's your? What's no, your I'm idea? really not. I'm. I don't know what I am, man. I. I like nice cars, but I won't spend a lot of money on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. weird. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, I mean, you guys know my cars. I, I got. I drive big SUVs and I have one car, so that's right. all. But you know, there's a difference when you when you do ride in one of those rides where it's like you go over a speed bump, you don't even feel it. You go, you know, you go from zero to ninety and you feel like you're going <laughs> forty. You know, it's like you just don't even feel it. Well, that's the whole thing with the voice, right? We want to feel the seamless ease and energy where it's just like, oh wow, we just feel. You don't want to hear those changes. Down. You just want them to take place smoothly, like you said. You yeah. was you were playing with an E natural going up to an F or something a few minutes yeah, ago. G, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or G, okay, I can't think that high, but yeah, you you know you want that to be when you play those two notes. So I just naturally did like this, just yeah, because yeah, yeah. I want to hear that effortless go. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's what you aim for. And I think that to your point with talking about the work that you've done technically with Mark Oswald, you you only get there by purposefully being specific about how you adjust the vowel and how you think of refining it in a way that will allow for that freedom. You don't just, you know, as, as Christian Van Horn uh, last week said, you don't just take a book and throw it at the bookshelf to hope that it, it lands okay, you know. <laughs> I think his his teacher uh, in, at Yale, uh, Richard Cross, had said, oh, yeah. yeah, he was like, let me show you how you just sang that note. He threw a book at the bookshelf, you know, and he was like, what I want you to do. And he took the book and placed it on the shelf. Oh, and, nice. and for him, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, and, you know, there's so many different ways and methods of teaching that can be everything from no, 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 that's an E natural on an A vowel. So that needs to be sung as a whatever, as yeah. opposed as opposed to a, a, a visual, uh, you know, idea yeah. of just placing the book on the shelf, like whatever, whatever works for it any particular individual is what works, you know. At old series, you tell me, you know, whatever value you can see, they make it work. It's not that random because it still has to sound like what it's supposed to sound. So I try to go for the most resonant thing that makes a beautiful, resonant, smooth sound and then color that vowel to make it. So it's, you know, it's not just vowel modification, it's placement. It's, yeah. you know, there's a whole technique involved with this, but you know, the, the great ones do it. You know, I can hear it yeah. in your voice. I hear it in my voice. And you, you hear, when you hear it, you know, you heard it. So you, you, you know, that person has it, you know? Well, it's interesting, so, you know, and I don't know how much, have you done any, any teaching? No, I haven't done a lot of teaching at all. I do individual sessions. I do a lot of master classes, especially. Well, sure. I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, when, when you, yeah. But I mean, when you start, you know, sort of helping another try to find what it is that you have found, you start mm -hmm. to really be challenged to come up with a language that yep. is easily communicative, right? So that it's not, any kind of big hurdle that you're asking them to jump through yeah. and it really requires the you know the the, the the teacher to be able to come up with a yeah. idea that makes sense and is simple and based on what you're saying you know this, this idea of finding a similarity in in sound from the top to the bottom but also a similarity in sound between whatever vowels that you might be singing in a given phrase yeah. That, yeah. that type of intervocalic vowel matching i think is so incredibly important um, and so, yeah, you know, it's like whatever vowel on whatever pitch works, but then mm -hmm. you've got to find like, okay, well, if that's an E vowel, if the next vowel in the word that you sing is an OO, you know, if you're going from a closed frontal to a closed yeah. back, yeah, you yeah. figure out like, okay, how do I make it sound like it's not like E, OO, you know, right. how do you find a similarity in pitch and resonance that so that at the end of the day, you have a consistency within that phrase or, or then from start to finish during the whole evening. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, at the end of the day, the one of the bigger challenges is to make sure that like, whatever you're singing, it's like, oh yeah, that's Morris. Oh and, yeah. And that, and that transition that you just spoke of, in fact, is one of the ones that gives you, it, if you do it correctly, you're healthy, healthily doing it. Yeah. And you don't get tired from doing it. You know, it becomes easier, you know? So right. yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's, it really is a thinking man's game. 
you know, family and friends think, oh, you do it all the time. You'll be fine. They don't understand. It's a thinking man's game. And, you know, I've been, like I said, I go out to my back porch and every day I warm up in the pollen because it's really bad here. And I'm, I need to know what I'm working with so I can know how to approach my voice daily. And right now it's something different every time because of what's going on, you know, naturally outdoors. So, yeah. you know, it's a thinking man's game. You don't just walk up and do it like I used to when I go up and sing the Lord's Prayer at church and Aunt Susie on the front door is happy. No, this is real <laughs> technical and it's important that you, <laughs> you know, people, people that listen to this stuff are listening for a certain thing. So you've got to deliver it, you know? Yeah. You Jason, know? Jason Brown just said, uh, what's something, and he said, heads up, that you wish someone told you about having a major career? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot. Um, you don't, you can live off of a lot less than you make. Oh, that's, that's epic right there. That is epic. And, and yeah, this, because and once you show me that, yeah. once you, once you get to a certain level in this industry, you can start really making some money and it's so easy to think like, oh, well, I've always used my paycheck to go and da 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 da, da you know, and once those paychecks get to a certain level, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I could, I could honestly take 90% of this and put this into my savings account. I don't need to use all of this. Think about the times that you lived off of, let's just throw a figure out there. Let's say you're making $12,000 a night. Right. And you're singing 50 times a year. $600,000 a year. Yep. You've never lived off of $600,000 a year before in your life. So why right. must you live off of it now? Like you've, you've made it work for $65,000 all this other time. So now all of a sudden you're out buying, you know, Rolex watches and, you know. This, yeah, you know, there's almost a feel like, well, I need to. I, I need well, I, mean, I should. I like, I, well, everybody else. Was, yeah. In my younger days, it was partly like, you know, you sacrifice for so long and you work your butt off. You want to enjoy these nice things. And then it becomes like, you know what? So stupid. You know, like, why well, drive the Escalade? I can buy the F-150, you know? <laughs> so, right, 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 right. I'm at that stage now. I don't need the Escalade. I don't get the F-150. Like, I really want to buy a pickup truck. That's my thing. But no, oh. I mean, just if that's, if that was, that's one thing I think all seniors need to learn because, you know, you can start making money fast and it starts coming in and it's cash and it's just rolling. But, you know, it's just not, you know, that's one of the things that you learn really quickly that, you can do without not so not to mention you got to pay taxes on that money so you better not be spending all of it yeah so you also realize that okay you got x amount of dollars that you're making you got to pay for housing on the road you got to pay for food on the road you usually rent a car which is an astronomical amount of money you're eating out all the time yeah and you got to pay every bill back at the house too so now you're running two households right you got to pay your agent you got to pay your taxes so you know, don't get caught up in the whole thing. You know, you make ten thousand dollars a night, you must be rich. No, I'm, it comes with a lot of obligations. And I mean, I'm no, Larry, the, I'm no Larry Brownlee, but you know. Well, you know, the, the biggest expense for me really is the biggest expense is coachings and lessons. Right. I mean, the thing is, is that you get into back into my career. You, you get out of it what you put into it, right? I paid so for it, man. I, I think it's it. it's so interesting to me when young singers look at me. Oh, you still take lessons? Please. Heck yeah. Yes. If you're going to be at the top of your game, you are, you know. Exactly. And, exactly. and I pay my coach, I pay my coach a nice amount of money. Exactly. Uh, you know, and it's, I can get a $40 an hour coach. I pay $100 an hour to learn everything I learned. And right. I do it, I'll probably put 20, 30 hours into each role. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, when you start to thinking about any other craft that you would expect to be at the highest artistic level, I mean, what, what do you, what do you think, you know, and it's funny because I think the problem is, is that people don't think about it. But when yeah. you stop to think about it, well, how, how do you think that these people get to where they are? How do you think that they're able to do what they do? I factor in how much it's going to cost me to learn a role. Yeah. That means flying to New York, getting a hotel, taking an Uber because I don't like to be on trains and paying somebody $100 an hour to teach me. How many times are going to have to do that for this role? Right, right, right. It might cost me $5,000 to learn a role. But well, I'm not, you know, I can't do the game late. So I don't sit down at the piano and pick my own notes. I don't, when I'm at home, I'm like doing home stuff. So I really don't have time to. So I'll take, when I get away from home, that's when I get my most work done. So it's important to me, if I'm going to stay at the top of my game, that's what I'm going to do. So that factor that in. So 
you know, it, this career takes an investment. At some point in time, it's going to be prime money investment. So, you know, you got to be able to put that that time and that effort in, that fin- the financial commitment in to be at the top of your game. That's how I see it, at least. Yeah, so. yeah. No, I hear you. Uh, we've, we've got some Gwendolyn Brown says hi to you. Hey, Gwendolyn, what's up? And uh, Rebecca Bab Nelson uh, says hi to us. You know, Rebecca, Rebecca Bab Nelson, who's over in Vienna, she and I went to school at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas together. And uh, incredible, incredible surprise. With Garrett Sorensen? Yeah, Garrett Sorensen. Yeah, you know, <laughs> y'all were in the Lindemann program together. We're in right? together, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Also, Kelly Gephardt says, Chuck and I always use the tax attorney to look at our deductible expenses instead of an accountant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you've got to, once you start really getting into this industry, you sort of have to learn how to navigate the things that we do. And we start to realize Oh yeah, the mileage that I'm driving from my house to the airport if I'm going on a business trip, that's deductible. You know, it's yeah. like and, and everything past that point, you know. Um yeah, my accountant worked for the IRS and his parents are opera singers. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it's like the perfect world. It's okay, make it work, but you know, so yeah. That's amazing. But you gotta that's know those ins and outs, you know. Well, we could we could sit here for another, you know, five hours <clears> and talk. It's been great to catch up with you and to hear a little bit more about your world. I really appreciate you coming on here and, and uh, sharing your experience with us. And uh, I know everybody's excited to be able to hear from you. So thank you again. And thank uh, you for I the hope, opportunity, brother. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. I hope you have a good rest of your of your day. Have a great weekend. And yep. uh, hopefully we'll see each other on the road soon. Yeah. All right, brother. Thank you, man. All right. Take care, everybody. Care, Peace. All right.